Hello, and this presentation is called Ethical Reasons for the Long Detour Around Evolutionary Anthropology. So we've looked at four paths that 19th century anthropology uh, followed in the search for human origins. And these led to the four subdisciplines sub of 20th century anthropology. Uh, one of these is anthropological linguistics, uh, which grows initially out of philology and historical linguistics. Secondly is archaeology, which grows out of the pursuit of material evidence of past humans. Third is ethnology and ethnography. And these uh, approaches come to have a new term or a new label in the 20th century. Uh, they're called social cultural anthropology. And that's a part of anthropology that focuses on living human communities. And lastly, the fourth subdiscipline of 20th century anthropology is physical anthropology, which today is called biological anthropology. So the four subfields emerge from this pursuit of human origins in the 19th century. And we're going to focus in on social cultural anthropology and why evolutionary approaches were abandoned by social cultural anthropologists. So we said that this fourth path of focusing on living peoples um, hit a stop sign in the late 19th, early 20th century. And we can't really talk about advances in scientific understandings of the human past uh, coming from social cultural anthropologists in much of the 20th century. So why is that? Uh, why were evolutionary approaches, and especially those associated with biology, abandoned? And the answer to that why question, uh, there's ethical reasons and theoretical reasons. So we're going to look at both of these. So if we go back to John Locke again, in his uh, treatises on government, here's a quote uh, from the second treatise uh, where he says, in the beginning, all the world was America and more so than that is now. And what he was referring to was the idea that America before European settlement represented the past of Europe. He didn't invent this idea. It was very current by the time he was working but that came to be the foundation of inquiry into living human communities. The idea that social and cultural and civilizational progress had been uneven in the world, and thus you had people representing different stages of development. So if we look at 19th century ethnography and ethnology, and this is the observation of living peoples, the recording of evidence about them, and the comparison of that evidence. We might pose the question, how can living peoples provide evidence about human origins? After all, we're all co-evil. We're all existing at the same time. We all have equally long histories, presumably. Um, but the key idea was uh, that some people are stuck in the past, uh, in fact, uh, history stalled for many peoples and only moved forward for others. There are historical peoples and peoples without history. So some societies came to be considered living fossils, represent representatives of the past. And this was the fundamental idea behind ethnography and ethnology in the 19th century. And this contains the idea of unequal development this is a quote from a Scottish ethnologist named John McLennan. So unequally has a species developed that every phase of progress may be somewhere observed. So this is uh, directly continuous uh, with John Locke's observation. And this uh, idea was repeated many, many times by Enlightenment thinkers and post-Enlightenment thinkers. It was a pervasive idea, and in the context of the time, it had tremendous political implications because, of course, Europeans, 
who considered themselves to be at the very forefront of history and the pinnacle of development were busy uh, conquering and exploiting peoples around the world. So it became bound up with that. This is sometimes called the doctrine of progress. And what uh, today looked by, like very ethnocentric uh, terms came to apply, be applied for stages of progress. Hunting societies were considered savages. Uh, those who were pastoralists or simple gardeners, barbarians. Uh, civilization only comes about with agriculture and reaches its fullest expression with the industrializing peoples, the commercial peoples. And this was the staircase to civilization. And these terms came to be the basic categories of comparison of 19th century ethnologists. Uh, the, their key emphasis was on understanding the passage from savagery to barbarism to civilization. And the idea was that there were contemporary representatives of each of these stages that you could go observe directly. To illustrate this, uh, this is a quote from, or the title of a book uh, written by Lewis Henry Morgan, who was an American ethnologist. So in 1877, he published Ancient Society, and the full title of Ancient Society is Researches in the Lines of Human Progress from Savagery through Barbarism to Civilization. It's worth noting that uh, Morgan was a progressive, an abolitionist, uh, very sympathetic, uh, for example, to Native American interest. Uh, but by the 1870s, he had come to share this uh, uh, general civilizational perspective on things. And it was a dominant framework of ethnological thinking. It became wedded in the 19th century to racial science. And uh, we're not going to have time to go into the details on that, but this came to dominate a lot of physical anthropology. And just the idea that human behavior then is determined by innate factors. And uh, when we wed these two perspectives together, we get the argument that unequal development results from innate inequalities. So again, uh, this had tremendous ideological and political implications and was applied very vigorously. And this is what led to 20th century social cultural anthropology. We can see it as a reaction uh, to both racism and ethnocentrism and social cultural anthropologists in Britain and the United States and later France uh, embraced cultural relativity and the argument that all humans are equally cultured, all cultures are of equal value. And along with this, they cut off the study of human differences in a temporal framework. So they more or less cut time off and stress the synchronic study of contemporary human societies. Similarly, because of the relation between a focus on biology and racism at the time, uh, they argued vigorously that learned behaviors or culture is really what humans are about. And this uh, we can call cultural determinism. So in the 20th century in sociocultural anthropology, um, there was a shift away from evolutionary approaches and from biology towards historical approaches and culture, but historical approaches that cut humans off from any kind of an evolutionary past and focused on living human communities in terms of their own particular histories uh, with generally quite shallow time depths. So this conflation of evolution and biology with progress and racial inequality was to cast a very long shadow over the 20th century. And indeed, when scholars in the night or scientists in the 1960s and 70s started trying to apply evolutionary biology to humans again, they were almost immediately denounced as racist, uh, whether or not uh, that uh, 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 
was an accurate uh, description. An example is Edward O. Wilson, um, who had water poured on his head at one meeting and then a sign placed over him that said, Wilson, you're all wet. Um, but there was a lot of controversy associated with the return of evolutionary biology in the 1960s and 70s uh, because it was interpreted as an effort to revive 19th century racism and civilizational uh, perspectives. However, it's very important to note that evolutionary biology today supports neither of these perspectives, and indeed it provides some of our strongest uh, critical uh, resources to challenge them. So to summarize here, the first reason for the long detour around evolutionary biology is simply that evolution and, and biology uh, became entangled uh, with the politics of race and progress. Uh, eugenics uh, in the early 20th century is an aspect of this. And quite reasonably, uh, many uh, Scholars uh, interested in humans uh, simply cut off uh, evolution and biology from the study of humans at that time. Uh, but this is a false equation today. Uh, the last thing you want to argue today is that uh, to study biology is to support race. Um, that's a foolish argument. And equating evolutionary biolo biology with uh, progressive ideologies is also false. This is a quote from Richard Dawkins, um, who's often attacked uh, for the same reasons as E.O. Wilson. But Dawkins writes that all uh, living lineages have an exactly equal time to evolve since the time of dawn of life. So evolution is positively antithetical to the idea that contemporary animals should be ranked on a higher or lower scale, evolutionary writers should not under any circumstances use the adjectives higher and lower. And what's interesting is this is exactly the argument that social cultural anthropologists made in the early 20th century. They argue that all human societies have an equally long history in their own histories and you should not uh, talk about them as higher or lower or arrange them in a progressive scale. And so evolutionary biology is entirely on the same page. Uh, this is often overlooked. And it's equally false to equate evolutionary biology today with racist ideologies. And in point of fact, evolutionary biologists have developed uh, by far the most compelling and cogent critiques of race. So if you want to challenge racist ideologies and that's your thing, uh, study evolutionary biology. Um, you'll be able to make a lot better arguments than if you're not familiar with uh, evolutionary biology. And if we look at uh, the objections then that are made to applying evolutionary biology to human behavior, uh, they're groundless today. And that's an important point to note. Certainly this class is not about uh, any kind of effort to revive racism or to revive ethnocentrism. Thanks for listening. There's more to come. One more to go.